Good morning. I'm Bert Ward, Dean of the School of Behavioral Brain Sciences, and I want to welcome you to the third speaker series offered by the Center for Children and Families. And uh, welcome you to an ice-free event. As many of you know, that the first attempt of programming this semester for the Center for Children and Families had to be canceled because of uh, ice closures of the university. This series is part of the outreach program of Center for Children and Families. Center for Children and Families is about three years old. It was uh, formed by a generous gift from the Medical Meadows Foundation and then has received support from another of, a number of other community and individual donors, and some of whom I've seen here today. We're very appreciative of the kind of support that has been provided from the community for what we feel like is a very important outreach of the university to the community. The center was formed to make sure that the expertise that exists with at the University of Texas Dallas was brought to bear on behalf of children in the community. And so we provide a number of kinds of programs, this being one of which, that tries to bring expertise that we have, others have, and work in collaboration with community agencies, learn from them, and help them as we can to make sure that Dallas is as good a community can exist on behalf of children. We have a great lineup of speakers coming up in the, in, uh, the rest of the semester. Uh, hopefully all of you receive cards, little cards that list that series, and we have great speakers coming. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Deb Weeby, a member of the series who's going to introduce Margaret Owen, today's speaker. Thank you, Bert, and thank you all for coming. We're really excited about this kickoff event for the third annual series. Um, all of the uh, speakers this um, in this series are focusing on um, the role and importance of family and interpersonal relationships for optimal development of children. And um, we're excited to have um, Dr. Margaret Owen as our kickoff speaker. Um, Dr. Owen is um, a professor of psychology at the University of Texas at Dallas here in the School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences. She also is the director for the Center for Children and Families. Um, and um, I am exceptionally um, thrilled that um, Margaret is going to be talking about us, uh, to us today about sensitive parenting. I've been aware of Margaret's work for years. Um, just to give you some background on her, she uh, received her PhD in developmental psychology from the University of Michigan in 1981. Um, focusing on infant, um, on mother, infant, and father, infant attachments, um, and has continued in that vein for a long time. She would, she's been a part of the Dallas community, involved with various um, agencies and organizations here, um, as well as um, it, uh, heavily involved in the academic and research and outreach mission of the School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences. Um, one of the unique features and, and um, uh, really wonderful qualifications is that uh, Margaret was uh, one of the primary investigators on the almost 20 year long study uh, on early child care and development that was sponsored by the National Institutes of Child and Human Development. And in her role there, she has videotaped and looked at and coded, it must be thousands at least hours of parent-child interactions. And through that process, she has come to have what I think is a very unique and important perspective on what parents can do to um, be the best parents they can be and promote the, the healthy development of children. So today she's going to talk to us about her insights. Please welcome Margaret. Thank Thanks, Deb. Thanks, Bert. Or introducing the center again to all of you and thank you all for coming. It's um, 
a nice crowd. We didn't know if people could find us if we moved somewhere else in the School of Management, but we're real happy with this location, and now you'll know where to come back. So I'm very, very happy to be here with you guys. Going. Um, and you've provided some insight into what I'm going to talk about, and that's very helpful. I am going to talk about parenting sensitivity, and my goals today um, are to help us reach a greater understanding about what sensitive parenting means. It's a term we all hear a lot, I hear a lot, um, and what I've been able to gain insight into, as Deb said, is the various components that make up this concept. So we're also going to talk about evidence for the importance of sensitive parenting for a growth-enhancing relationship with your child. And I'm going to talk about five features that we think define sensitive parenting. And I'm going to show you sensitive parenting in action. Um, since I am uh, an observer of parent-child interactions and have looked at, oh golly, maybe 10,000 video, I haven't, but we've been involved with thousands and thousands of videotapes of parent-child interaction, we think we have some things to show you. So... Our theme for this spring is relationships and development. And we'll be talking about the important role of all kinds of relationships in life. And I think as noted, this is to me, I love this quote, as noted by the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child of Harvard University, relationships are the active ingredients in the environment's influence on human development. And I hope that we'll be sharing this notion with you over and over this spring. Sensitive parenting involves a process of interaction that changes both the child and the parent. In what we call a transactional process, good relationships are based on individualized responsiveness, mutual action and interaction, and emotional connection. And these, I think, are experiences of sensitive parenting. So the definition, typically, that we see in research, and I think it's a fine one, is that sensitive parenting is the parent's timely responses to the child's signals and behaviors in an appropriate and effective manner. And now we can pull that apart in a lot of ways, you know, what's appropriate, what's effective, what are we really talking about? And that's what I hope we'll get into. The research shows us that sensitive parenting really does matter for children. There is there are streams, reams of, of research showing that sensitive parenting matters because it is the basis of the development of a secure attachment between the child and parent, between the child and other caregiving adults. Sensitive parenting enables the child to develop insights into others other people's, uh, people's needs, people's thoughts, their feelings. It is the basis for development of perspective taking and cooperation. It nurtures stronger cognitive skills. It supports better self-control of the child. It helps prevent be behavior problems. Many, many studies documenting all of these positive benefits. And in the study that I was involved in for so many years, the NICHD Study of Early Child Care and Youth Development, we found in study after study, analysis after analysis, in our families, in our 1,200 families, that sensitive parenting was the strongest and most consistent predictor of better cognitive functioning, better social-emotional skills, better language. And what I think provides, well, let me talk, let me point out too, with children with disabilities, um, in the large early intervention collaborative study, which is the uh, largest longitudinal study of the development of children with disabilities who, are exper who experienced early childhood intervention. In that study, which tracked children with motor disabilities, Down syndrome, developmental delay, better developmental outcomes, regardless of the type of disabilities the child had, were predicted by 
warmer, more sensitive, more responsive caregiving. So another piece of evidence. And then this was what I wanted to tell you, that I think that probably some of the better evidence is for the importance of sensitive parenting is what happens when parenting sensitivity changes. Um, we found that when sensitivity increased from infancy to three years of age, infants' attachment security changed from insecure to secure. And then in another study, we found that insecure infant parent attachment was related to more behavior problems in first grade, except when maternal sensitivity increased over that period of time. So when in our observations of mother-child interactions, when we observed and rated and saw that sensitivity was increasing from one year of age, when the child was one year of age, to 54 months of age, insecure attachment no longer predicted behavior problems. The change in sensitivity predicted, uh, predicted fewer behavior problems. It all, improvements we are finding also matter in middle childhood. Sensitivity, sensitive parenting is a concept that's relevant across all ages of caregiving, of parenting. And so for children whose parents, both mothers and fathers, became more sensitive in our observations of them across middle childhood, at age 15, those children were better adjusted fewer externalizing behavior problems, less impulsivity, greater social competence with peers, better cognitive capabilities, greater social maturity. I think this is strong evidence. And I have to, t I have to mention, too, that caregiving sen its sensitivity in child care matters a great deal. I think one of the uh, strongest findings we have from studies of early child care is that higher quality child care is associated with more optimal child development. What's the active ingredient in higher quality child care? Sensitive caregiving. So what we see when we're looking at that active ingredient in child care is that higher quality caregivers are responsive to the children's needs and behavior, they provide cognitive stimulation geared to the child's interests and abilities. They are warm and positive. They're not emotionally detached. And they respectfully support the child's interests and agenda, activities. They provide sensitive caregiving. When we look at the effects of, of um, better caregiver to child ratios, when we look at the effects of greater training of caregivers, we find that what carries that effect on positive outcomes, both social and cognitive in the children, is our observations of sensitive caregiving by those caregivers. So given this strong body of research, and given my years of coding parent-child interaction, and given a collaboration that I formed with Dr. Cynthia Frosch, we developed a way of conveying to others the concept of sensitive caregiving and the components of sensitive caregiving. And we built this based upon um, our methods of training coders to observe parent-child interaction. We made training tapes. Here's an example of high. Here's an example of low. And we thought we should do that for others, not just train our research assistants, but tra train parents train other caregivers, train folks who are trying to help caregivers and parents. And so we asked um, parents to come in and let us videotape them interacting with their children and get proper permissions so that we could share those observations and talk about the lift different little components of sensitive caregiving. When we came up, Cindy came up with this wonderful acronym that we call the Ready Method. And I think it illustrates, it talks about the different features that we observe that constitute sensitive caregiving, sensitive parenting. So a sensitive parent responds to the child's cues, engages with the child, is connected and expressive 
with her child, acknowledges the child's perspective, adjusts to meet the child's needs, develops the child's skills, and yields to the child's interests and agenda. And I'm going to talk about each one of these things, and we're going to look at examples. If I can make this move. But first I want to tell you that there are really <clears throat> two pathways to insensitivity. One is intrusiveness, being highly directive, acting out of the parent's own agenda, oblivious to the child's interests, rejecting the child's signals. The other is detachment, the parent who's aloof, distracted, emotionally disconnected, or if they respond maybe with delay, or if they respond, you have a sense that there's not a connection here and the parent's just going through the motions. Okay. So let's talk about each of these features. The first one, respond. This is about reading the child's cues and responding in a timely and appropriate manner. Ah, sensitive caregiving. This is a matter of finding the right fit between your behavior and the cues that are seen in the child, the child's behavior. Sometimes that's not easy. Different personalities take different kinds of responses. Different situations are more difficult, harder to read. Distress is um, one of the biggies. And sometimes you have to try and try again. But you work at this. So here's our first example. We're going to look at a lot of these. And you have to look carefully. But what I want you to do is look at this first example with mom and her baby, Charlie. Charlie, I think, about four months old? About four months old. This is our youngest baby to see. And this is a tickling game. And watch the baby's behavior and watch the mother's behavior, and we'll talk about it. Let's hope it works. Okay, I love Charlie. <laughs> He's learned a lot in four months. Um, and you see a dialogue going on there. Um, mom's, fitting, mom's fitting into that dialogue, the baby's behavior, but he's speaking to her too. And she's catching those signals. Um, when he turns away, that's a sign. Hey, maybe it's enough. Maybe I back off for a little bit. And then he says, bring it on. And so she brings it on again. And then he more clearly turns away and says, well, maybe now it's time for something else. Now, tickling is sort of tricky. Um, it can become a very intrusive game. And what we did with this mom and this baby is that we asked her then to act differently and to respond to behave more intrusively. So this is an act on her part. Um, uh, I think that's one way we can show these videos. But what's real important here is to look at the baby's behavior in that context because we can't tell the baby how to act. So let's look at the next.
kind of. Okay, it's enough. <laughs> so what's different about Charlie's behavior? So how can you tell? He's not laughing anymore. He's moving and, you know, first glance you could say, hey, he's having fun. He's really, you know, moving his hands and legs. But his movements are stiffer, Yeah. And his muscles are tenser, right? You got it. He's he is definitely tenser. It's not as smooth. Nervous, Nervous? maybe. Uh, what's coming next? <laughs> How close is this thing going to come? <laughs> and his signals aren't being picked up upon by mom when she is just with her agenda. As I'm going to shake and get a response out of my child. It's a really different, different kind of connection. Okay, so let's go to the next feature. <laughs> and we're going to show you, I'm going to show you an example of engagement and expressiveness, which we think is a big, important feature of sensitive caregiving. This is a matter of providing a physically and emotionally secure presence with eye contact and active listening, watching what the child does, asking questions, physical affection and contact. There's all kinds of ways that you can be engaged with the child in a way that's not detached and in a way that's not intrusive ah, and enthusiasm. So here is JP with his dad. And um, JP, JP's dad is going to show us a lot of his delight. He's going to show us. He's going to... JP, I think, is going to sense his dad's delight. And watch how expressive dad is and his smiles and his laughter. There aren't signs of detachment here. Okay. I hope you were noticing JP's behavior. I talked about dad. Signs of connection, signs of engagement. Um, and you heard, heard every little sound that JP made, there was a sound coming back from dad too. There was um, a vocal connection. There was certainly a physical connection. There was emotional supportiveness here. It's just lovely. Now, whoops, sorry, we're going to contrast this. Um, Mom in this episode um, with her daughter Avery is flat and unexpressive. And we ask her to do that. Um, this is our low example. And um, Avery asks for help. Um, but Mom's response, it does come, but it's delayed. And that's something we notice. Um, Avery persists, and a response does come, but listen to the quality of that response, and think about that phrase, going through the motions, okay? 
And then, again, watch Avery's behavior and what she does. These get very quiet. <laughs> um, here you, you see a lack or a delay in response, but you see an absence of engagement. When there is a response, it's not truly an engaged response. And Avery gives up. She turns away, puts her back to her mom. She's not getting anything. She's not probably getting what she typically does get. Uh, she's got her expectations violated there a bit. But there are other, we're, we parents always have other tasks to do too. And certainly parents can't always be engaged and expressive, or maybe they can be. We asked one dad in one of our videos to um, be detached and just read the newspaper. And we ended up using that clip to demonstrate great multitasking. He was reading the newspaper, but he couldn't help but hear his child, see his child, and insert, you know, little comments. The kid did not experience his dad as gone, detached, not engaged. Dad was reading, reading a newspaper and still engaged. So let's go to the next feature, acknowledge. Acknowledging the child's perspective and adjusting to meet the child's needs. This um, is about, in part, how we often have to try multi multiple responses or multiple attempts to get it right in addressing the child's underlying need. Um, you know, often the case with a distressed or a crying child. Acknowledging the child's perspective is often so helpful acknowledging their emotions, recognizing them, naming them. And to do this well, we're always gathering information about the child. And sometimes you don't see your child all day long. Your child's in child care. You're at work. Um, you need to know more about what those experiences were like during the day. This is about talking to the child's caregiver, and sharing information with that caregiver about the child's morning, the child's evening, the weekend, the special events. You need information. And then you've got greater ability to acknowledge. Acknowledge who this child is and validate those, validate those emotions and behaviors. So in this example, mom introduces um, a fun shape sorter to Quinn. And uh, when, when Quinn puts a, um, a block into the shape sorter, mom acknowledges his, his success, you know, there you go. Um, but then when Quinn gives signs that he wants to be closer and not occupied with this uh, shape sorter, mom acknowledges this different need and she responds. So let's take a look.
Sorry, make it louder. That's weird. Okay. okay, so did you see how mom adjusted? She was able to acknowledge Quinn's need to be closer and let go of um, the play for the moment and then adjust and help Quinn play from her lap where he was definitely more comfortable and turns back to play um, really closer to his secure base there. Okay, So, in this contrasting example, you're going to see mom's pacing is much quicker. It doesn't have the smoothness that we saw in the other example. And this is, again, um, an example about the differences between sensitive parenting and more intrusive parenting. So, in many ways, we can see this as a good interaction, that's for sure. But mom pulls out all the cups very quickly, and she doesn't give Quinn an opportunity to look at them or engage with them, and she doesn't acknowledge his interest um, or give him an opportunity to make choices. So, he, um, again, his behavior will look different, so let's take a look. And she turns him right back around and <laughs> she doesn't bring him up. So his interests aren't acknowledged. She doesn't adjust. And he gets a little more frenetic. And certainly the opportunities that are there to provide appropriately paced and... Um, um, well, stimulation that really meets his level and his interest is gone. They're playing, but he's not getting out of this interaction what he got in the very few things that might have occurred in the previous interaction. So, you know, he pushes the purple cup away, he fusses, he twists away. Certainly the flow of interaction is less connected. So, in... Um, in last spring's uh, spring lecture series, we heard from Dr. Ann Van Cleek, and she talked about how reading with your child is a wonderful way to provide a langu language-rich environment, as well as teaching early preliteracy skills uh, that include knowledge about books. Um, and certainly, um, this is a wonderful place where we could start, but I hope you all came last year and you heard her wonderful lecture. You can also think about all kinds of everyday activities that are opportunities to stimulate the child's development. Go to the grocery store. Look at different colors, different shapes, different smells, different tastes. There are lots of samples out there. Um, lots of opportunities to see familiar things and relate them to what we have in the household or what we're going to do tomorrow. they are flowers. There's all kinds of things in the everyday world that are opportunities for good stimulation of development. So, label, describe, demonstrate, 
make learning meaningful by associating what you see and what you hear and what you experience with activities that the child has, what you did yesterday, what you're going to be tomorrow. Be a conversational partner. And now, in this example, this next example, Ellie and her mom are going to work on this puzzle. And this is a little bit longer clip, but I like it a lot. This is, uh, you'll see when she pulls out the pieces, this is a very challenging puzzle for a child of her age. Mother provides really wonderful support, not too much. She's not overly directive at all. She gives little hints. She gives encouragement. It is a great example of scaffolding. And let's see what Ellie can do. You look at that big, empty puzzle there, and you go, oh my god, how is she going to do this? At least I think that. So maybe a new word, right in the middle, and then points out where we're talking about. The middle of the bottom. That's complex. So mom's engaged and expressive, too. She's complimenting. It does. Um, believe it or not, Ellie finishes this puzzle. It's a toughie. She doesn't get frustrated. Believe me, she, she completes it. I guess you can tell now. Um, I want to show you a contrast, though. In this, in this contrasting example, uh, Ellie's mom shows us um, the effects, really, of providing minimal support in a situation like this. Um, you know, Ellie's, Ellie's completed this puzzle once before, um, and we'll see what kind of help she probably needed. Let's just see what happens here. Um, for the most part, Mom doesn't respond uh, to Ellie's questions and her need for help. Uh, she responds at times, but the response is slow, and it doesn't really connect with Ellie. And that's a quality I want you to observe here. Um, Mom isn't really engaged with Ellie's work on the puzzle, and she seems distant, disconnected. Um, and then, let's see what happens in terms of Ellie's capabilities. <laughs> oh, gee, thanks. <laughs> I 
I think that was mom's agenda and not Ellie's. <laughs> It's been a long day for mom. But Ellie can't do it now. The response, the, the support has just gone away and her capabilities are certainly lower it seems now. She seemed so capable, remarkably so. Mother didn't do the puzzle for her before. She was scaffolding. She found just the right amount of support to help the child achieve something that she can't achieve on her own. And I think that's a great example of, of course, differences in stimulation, but sensitively provided, the difference between doing that in a sensitive fashion and not. So we've got one more feature I'm going to talk about, yield. The opposite of yielding is really um, the feature that we've been talking about, I talked about earlier, intrusiveness. Um, yielding to the child's interests and needs, it encourages and supports greater autonomy, the development of greater autonomy in the child. Um, yielding, though, isn't caving in. Still, the parent is hopefully stronger and wiser and still kind. Um, yielding, though, allows the child to have a voice in her world, a voice in his world. Um, as my colleague Cindy Frosch says, children are empowered when they believe their voice is heard and honored. It's a wonderful thing. So this idea of yielding is often a bit scary for parents. They think they are the person in charge, in control, and they have to maintain control. And in many respects, that does need to be conveyed and understood and felt by the child. But yielding is a part of acknowledging the child's interests, <coughs> letting the agenda go the way the child may, in the way that the child wants to go for a while, you know, continuing an activity if the child wants to, changing the activities when the child loses interests or needs help to re-engage. But sometimes the greater need might not be what the child's experiencing or sensing is their greater need at that moment. The child who wants to continue playing and is obviously getting more difficult, irritable, having some tr trouble, the greater need is probably that they need sleep and structure needs to pr be provided to help move them into the bedroom, into the bed with some good routines. So we've got, do we have time? I don't know if we have time for this next example. Um, I hope you get the idea of yielding. Um, we'll show a little bit. Okay, it's a nice example here of yielding to Camille's interests in what she wants to do with this stacking the colored cups. Mom kind of guides her in stacking the cups, but yields when, when Camille pulls back the green cup, doesn't insist on one way of doing it and one way alone. Well, let me just tell you, I mean, it'd be fun to watch her, but, but uh, Camille's interest now becomes not just stacking these, but of course, stacking them and knocking them down, and <laughs> mom goes for it, and they have a great time together. It, the, the joy of this play is, is really shared. So I do have just one more example, because I love seeing this pair. Um, one more clip, I just can't resist. So Sierra's mom here is very present to the experience that 
that Sierra's having. She's emotionally available, one of our features. She's involved and connected with Sierra. And Mother acknowledges her interest in the shape sorter by moving it closer. She leans in closer. Sierra discovers the, the fun of shaking a block, and Mom joins in and makes, makes it even more fun. It's quick. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Makes me smile, too. I'd like to be in the room. Okay, so to recap, sensitive parents and sensitive caregivers respond to the child's cues, engage with the child, they're connected and they're expressive, they acknowledge the child's experiences, the child's perspective, they adjust their behavior to meet the child's needs, they develop the child's skills, and they yield to the child's interests and agenda. That's why we call it the ready method. So I'm going to stop or end with just, um, I think, a, p a few implied uh, tips for enhancing sensitive parenting. Go. First of all, read the child's signals by following her gaze and her vocalizations, reaches, face, facial expressions, movements. Respond to the child based on the likely meaning of the behavior. You don't know for sure. You try to understand what that means. And if you didn't get it right, you try something else. You adjust. And sometimes it takes lots of tries to find the right response but keep at it. Respond to cries. You can't spoil your baby by responding to the baby's cries. Acknowledge your child's perspective with simple descriptions of the experience or simple descriptions of the feelings that you think the child is having. Sometimes that acknowledgement is one of the best responses that you can have. So, We'll end with that display of lots of sensitive caregiving, and I hope you've come to um, a better appreciation for what it involves. And I want to say thanks to Cindy Frosch and to Jamie Hirsch, who, is, um, who has rated videotapes with me for many years now and is continuing to do that, to the NICHD Study of Early Child Care and Youth Development, and to the Dallas Preschool Readiness Project. And thank you all. That was really mm -hmm. interesting. I want to, um, we have time for a few questions. Um, and then um, I Our want to make okay. sure I have some announcements. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to make these announcements before people do. Um, <laughs> uh, first, we have uh, a reception out in the uh, hallway outside of here uh, so that if you have questions that you can't get answered during this time, please join us out there. Second, um, for those of you who um, are wanting continuing education credits, we have those uh, available. If you didn't sign in and get a sheet um, beforehand, they're on the table outside where you entered, please do that. And then finally, uh, or third, um, everybody received, I think, an evaluation form. We really would appreciate it if you would fill those out. There will be people available to pick those up as you exit. And then the final thing is to uh, uh, make sure that you put on your calendar the next um, in the series of our talks, which will be in March. Um, March 25th. March 25th. Another so, Friday. <laughs> yeah, in this same room. Now you know where it is. So we're happy that you were able to make it. And sorry for the 
interruption in the flow of the inflammation, but I do want to mm -hmm. open it up for questions. A few. <laughs> oh, Cindy, you guys. Right outside on the table for the reception, there'll be some uh, postcards if you didn't pick up one up and have all the information for the next three lectures, as well as the information that are in the screen. So that we'll be looking to those with you and show those to your colleagues. Questions? Yes. Candace. So a lot of the examples that you showed us were of children engaging in inflammatory play behavior. And so the method was okay, it's very clear. What about if your child is throwing a tantrum? You touched a little bit on it at the end, but can you talk more about applying sensitive parenting in those situations? Well, I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a hard situation. Um, and Cindy's great about talking about this and has worked with um, many parents and in particular worked with child care providers as well. But I think that um, something that is often where you should start is some acknowledgement of what that experience is for the child. Um, not negating it, not saying you're not really upset, or not saying what's wrong with you, but saying this is hard, you're having a hard time hard time today, hard time with this, maybe we can make some changes, maybe we can offer some new choices, um, but I think acknowledging the child's perspective, trying to understand that better and trying to connect and say, I'm feeling what you're feeling or I'm seeing what you're feeling and let's give some words to it is a good place to start. You want to say something else, Cindy? Yeah, Kim Leo writes a book on Connection Parenting and she talks about connecting before correcting. And I really like that little simple word because if you take a moment to really connect with the child before you correct their behavior, mm -hmm. you acknowledge your own frustration because often where a lot of the parenting decisions and the caregiving decisions come out are out of fear. So fear, oh my gosh, everyone's looking at me. What are they thinking? They're judging my parenting. I'm getting them all in my child's laying on the floor. You know, it's like you have to block everything else out and really connect first with your child before you even try to change the child's behavior. And that's where going with the acknowledgement of saying, this is hard, you're frustrated, you want five more bags of chips, we're done for today, I'm going to help you leave, you know, and mm -hmm. you can do it in a mm -hmm. way that's really gentle and kind, and so we're not, mm -hmm. you're still engaged, you're not saying, if you don't stop right now, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not yeah. going to take you to the store ever again and then ignore the child. You know, because that might get the child to stop, but that's just going to create anxiety on the inside for the next time it happens, so you have to start back to square one. Mm -hmm. Right, so still following that, responding, staying engaged, acknowledging the child's perspective like Margaret just, you know, described. And then when you can, if, if you can still find a way to yield, which is like, okay, do you want to walk on your own or can I pick you up? You know, and so you're mm -hmm. still yielding, you're still giving the child a choice um, to help them feel empowered, but it's not as much of that power struggle. Like right. a, lot of right. the, a lot of the challenges in, in uh, tantruming are out of our own fear that we're being watched, we're being judged, and that's where it comes to yeah, and often, in, you know, in the midst of uh, the display of the exaggerated, what you might think of as exaggerated emotion, that's not the time for a lesson uh, about, you know, not, not time to give the correction. But sometimes, a little bit later, when everything's calmed back down, you can talk about perhaps something about that situation that was particularly hard that we're going to try to not, not do next time. Um, but not at the moment, um, and punishment will not help <laughs> at that moment. Okay, yeah. Um, I love the examples that they were all one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. I have very, like, a Multiple set kids? of very small children. <laughs> yeah. And um, what would be, because I feel like when I have a one-on-one, -on -one, I do a really good job, mm -hmm. but when it, you know, when it has to kind of scatter out, mm -hmm. what would be some mm -hmm. recommendations on making sure all of their needs are met, because, you know, often they come at the same time. Right. Same. Right, 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 right. Um, and, and you wish you were three people at once. Right, right. Um, I, I guess I'm going to use the word acknowledge again. And in a way, your kids mean that every, your multiple kids mean that you're always multitasking. It's not just when you want to read a newspaper, if you could ever read a newspaper, right? Um, and uh, um, sometimes you need to explain that I, we're going to, be spending more, I'm going to be spending more time with, with Joe right now, but in a little bit, it'll be time for you. And you might actually make a plan to have some special one-on-one -on -one time with the individual children and find a way that that can work. Because 
one-on-one -on -one time is great. And of course, their relationships with each other are great too, and you are there to help support that as well. Um, but I think a plan for some one-on-one -on -one time is wonderful. And it might reassure the child that I'm going to have that too. And they observe you having it with someone else and hearing one of their siblings and hear that they're going to get that too. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> People want coffee. I have a question. Oh, you have a question. Well, I have a comment and a question. One of the comments is that what I really love about what you're showing mm -hmm. is um, explicitly as well as implicitly that you don't have to be perfect to be a sensitive parent. I mean, you know, you ask parents to not be sensitive mm -hmm. with their child, which implies to us that it's not the end of the world if you're not oh, yeah. sensitive once in a while. And I think that we get those messages yeah. that, you know, you, you should be perfect and things like that. So I think that's really comforting mm -hmm. to, to hear that and see that and that it's all a process of learning yeah. and, and you're never done being a sensitive yeah. parent. No. Which brings me to my yeah. question, yeah. which is, um, I have a 12 year old. Not older children. <laughs> yeah. I have a 12 year old. And, you know, she's starting the autonomy stuff and things like this. Does it change? I mean, all of the things you're talking about clearly are highly relevant to my interactions with her now. They but, are. But, but are there additional things or other things that you think of? Well, I mean, there are certainly other dimensions of good, good parenting. Um, we haven't even talked about you know, issues of monitoring and how that changes over time. But I think good monitoring of, of your teenager, when she becomes a teenager, good monitoring will come out of the good relationship that was built earlier. You can't monitor in an effective way if you don't have a relationship in which information is exchanged. And the ways in which you listen to your child and connect with your child and sensitive to your child's underlying needs. It's the same issue regardless of the age of the child. You know, I was talking about the evidence of, of uh, sensitive parenting in middle childhood. It's the same dimensions. It's the same way. It, we're not looking at specific behaviors. The specific behaviors and the context change but it's a, it's a style and it's a manner of connecting that we find is important no matter what the age is. I hope, you know, with my 20 year olds. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, thank okay. you very much. Thanks. Please join us in the uh, hallway for a reception. And thank you, Margaret, for a great time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.